to start outside because he has some very interesting demos to show us. And uh, we need the sunshine. We need the sunshine. You know, it's about solar power, so that's why we're in the sun. Okay, so let me just say that uh, my name is Bob Eisenstein, and uh, I'm the president of an organization called the Santa Fe Alliance for Science. And the purpose of our organization is to get scientists more in contact with kids like you. And so we started about uh, eight months ago, we started these science cafes, and we have one about every, I don't know, two months or so. This is the third one we've had. The previous two were, I think, quite successful, and it looks as though this one is going to be as well. Uh, so our, our speaker tonight is Ben Luce, and he is a theoretical physicist from Los Alamos uh, National Labs. And he also is, let me get the title exactly correct, director of the New Mexico Coalition for Clean and Affordable Energy. And last evening he gave a lovely talk at the, at the uh, on behalf of the Santa Fe Institute at the uh, James, James, a. James A. Little Theater. Thank you. So that was one of the, one of them in the series of the Santa Fe Institute uh, public lectures, which they give about every, well, almost every month, actually. So uh, tonight's event is sponsored uh, largely by the Santa Fe Institute, by the O'Keeffe, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, who very generously loans us this space for the evening, uh, the New Mexico Public Education Department, the Santa Fe Public Schools. So there are a lot of people involved. I want to acknowledge Stacy Blyden over here, who is from the Institute, who, is, uh, who has helped uh, several times to set the, uh, get us set up and going. Uh, okay, so uh, before we start and go outside, uh, Shannon, who is here from the O'Keeffe, wants to tell you about the artwork that you see on the walls. So. The artwork is all done by Santa Fe High School students, and the art opening is tomorrow night at 5, and it goes till 7 o'clock, and there'll be refreshments, and we'd love to see all of you here to support them. So I guess at, at that point, I don't have anything more to say. I will turn the event over to our, our speaker, Ben Luce, and so take it away. Okay. Good evening. How are you guys? Well, good. For those of you who came late, should we just sit down? You know, we're going to go, go outside, outside in just a second. So, but I'd like to get to know you folks a little better. How many people are in high school here? Anybody in junior high? <coughs> and anybody in grade lower than that? Okay, so all junior high, high school. Um, how about uh, which high schools? Anybody from, say, the south part of Santa Fe? <laughs> south part meaning, say, uh, I'm not sure. Capital High. It's hard to say, yeah, for example, Capital. Yeah, where, where are you guys? Like Monte del Sol. Monte del Sol, okay. Right. Have any of you seen our solar exhibits come by our school before in the past? Yeah. Some of you have? Okay, so some of this may be a little bit familiar to you. So if it's familiar, uh, uh, I apologize for that, but we will uh, see some slides in a little while, and I think I'll have a lot of new stuff there that you probably haven't seen before, uh, stuff that we don't normally do at the school visits, just because we don't have a screen and stuff like that. All right, well, let's go outside, and uh, if you have a hat, bring it along. Uh, it's kind of bright. I've come, yeah, let's just form a bit of a semicircle here so you can see this. And stand at least where, where, where you can see the front of this panel. So this is what people typically call a solar panel, um, but it has a more specialized name. This particular kind of panel, we call it a photovoltaic panel. Uh, this is a, a panel that produces electricity, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Can you see the little crystals in there, the, the blue crystals? Those are actually two-dimensional crystals, they're, or they're, they're, they're uh, slices of, of three-dimensional crystals, which are embedded in that, in that surface there. How about the little wires? Can you see the wires going across? Okay, so what this does is this produces electricity the instant the sun shines on it. When we go back inside, we'll take a little bit more of a look at, at how it does that. Um, but come on up. Uh, let's, uh, let me see, let me have a, two volunteers, a guy and a girl. There's a guy, there's a girl. Okay, why don't you come up, just stand, shade the solar panel for a minute, cast a good shadow on it. Okay, cover the whole thing. <laughs> you got it all? <laughs> okay, now jump away. Okay, step to the side. Yay! 
<laughs> Anyone else want to try? Come on up. Don't be shy. This is your chance to interfere with solar energy. Now, since you're up here, let me try tell you on something else. Come on around the side here for a second. Just put your hand over one of those cells there. So we cover the whole cell. Just, just that, that uh, put side. Yeah. Okay. Now, do that to the other cell. One of these cells over here. Can you cover them all the way up? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? You shut it all the way off. Can anyone guess why that is? You need the whole panel to work. Basically, you want the whole panel. And you see how these are strung together like this? Well, they, they're, they're all strung together in a loop. Each one of these is an individual solar cell. And if any one of them doesn't work, it shuts down the whole loop. So that's something about the way solar cells are often are wired together, basically. And when he covered those two cells, it shut off one cell in each loop, and that was enough. All right, let's take, a, let's take a look at something else here. This is a solar oven. I just set it out here so it's not very hot yet. Anybody here ever have a solar cookie? A couple people, okay. Same kind of oven, right? See something like this? All right, so in a little while, this oven will get really hot. Right now, it's only at about 150 degrees. In about five minutes, it'll be at about maybe maybe 300, 250. Um, so what, what are these things for? What do they do? Conduct light. Not quite, conduct isn't quite the right word. Reflect it. Reflect it, yeah. You got the idea. So light comes down here, reflects off. How about the glass? What does glass do to light? Magnifies it. It can if it's warped. But more mundanely, what does it do? The light goes through it, right? What do we call a, a substance that light can go through? Transparent and translucent. Yeah, so the light can go in there. Now, what color is it inside there? Can you see? Black. Black. So what happens to light when it hits a black surface? It stays there. It absorbs it, right. It doesn't reflect back out. So the light energy comes down, it reflects, it transmits, then it absorbs. And what happens when it's absorbed? What form of energy is the, is the light energy converted into? Heat, right. And can the heat come out of the oven very easily? No, how come? What's trapping it? The, the glass is trapping it, right. And that's, that, that's an effect we often call the greenhouse effect. So this is like a little greenhouse, but with a big, big reflector on it to make it really hot. And this gets so hot inside that you can cook in it. In fact, you can cook in it really well. So, you know, if I don't put any food in there, on a clear day, it'll get up to about 400 degrees. When you put food into it, it gets a little cooler because some of that energy is going into to making steam, and the steam escapes. So some of the energy escapes that way, but it, but it gets incredibly hot. OK, so that's two things already. We see we, we can cook with solar energy. We can produce electricity with it. Let's take a look at um, at a really serious system that you could actually use use a house on. So um, why don't you come on over closer? I'm going to move this oven, and we'll move that out of the way. Okay. And come on in real close. Take a come on. You can walk up. Take a look at the cells. Uh, if you were to plug this into that, yeah. would it like shoot out extremely far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what would happen is if you plug these panels all together into that little pump, that poor little pump would go just poof, it would, it would burn out right away. Or it would shoot out for about a second. You'd probably get a real burst of water. It would go about 20 feet in the air, and then, then it would just burn out. OK, so, <laughs> so this, is, this is really serious solar panels. These are the kind that you can actually use on a house. We have about, we think about a thousand houses in New Mexico that live off the, off the power grid, that live off in remote areas and actually get their power in this way. This system's about big enough to power either a, a pretty small house or like a cottage. Most people would have about twice this number of panels. 
Um, but again, can you, you can see the individual cells, right? And then you can see the little wires. These pick up the electricity. And then the electricity flows into here. And this, this um, trailer is pretty special because it not only captures the solar electricity, but it, it stores it. It's got, a, it's got a large set of batteries in the back here. And, in, and it, when, we, when we're done, we'll, we'll take a, a closer look at that. All right, so let me see. Um, back up a little bit. And uh, so unplug that. Let's um, find a position where you can, you can see the light bulbs pretty well. All right, I need another volunteer here. Come on up. All right, in fact, I need two. I need one from each side. And uh, you. Okay. Come on the other side here. You two seem to work together well, so. Oh, on this side. Yeah, okay. come on this side. All right. And you're going to control that switch. You're going to control that switch. Okay. okay. All right, now, first of all, I'm going to ask how many people have this kind of light bulb in their house? The newer kind. Okay, quite a few hands. How many people have mostly this kind? All right. Now, this kind is what most people are still using. It's called an incandescent light bulb. And it works. It just works very simply. It just puts electricity through a little filament. The filament gets hot and it makes light. This works in an entirely different way. It basically has electrons travel through a gas in there. And those electrons collide with the, the white stuff in there. And it stimulates it and ca causes phosphorescence. It causes light. So, and they work in very different ways. So you go ahead and hit that light bulb. and. Um, if you all could tell me, let me see, make sure it's on the right setting here. Okay. Okay, go ahead and turn it off and on one more time to wake up the meter there. We should see a reaction there. There it goes. What are you seeing on the meter there? Is that a measurement? Yeah. Like the wattage? Yeah. This is, this is the wattage, the number of watts. Can you guys see that? How many is it, roughly? 14, 15. 14, 15? Okay, okay. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to cover that up, and you go turn your light bulb on. All right, now compare the two bulbs. Which one do you think is brighter? On the left. The swirly. The curly, the, the, what do you call it? The swirly. Yeah, that's a good name. All right, so yeah, the one on the left is actually a little bit brighter to the eye. Most, most people think that. All right, now go ahead and turn yours off. And I want you to guess uh, how much power that bulb is drawing now in watts. 70. 30. Yeah, 70. 70. 70. 30, 70, here a bunch of range there. Okay, but how much did the other one draw? 15, 14. 14, all right, so what do you see now? Fifty-eight, sixty, fifty-seven. 58, 60, 57, so it's around 60, right? And that's actually right, that's what the bulb says it's supposed to draw on there. All right, so 60 watts, 14 watts. How many times does roughly, does 14 go into 60, very roughly? four times, right? So this bulb uses four times as much energy to produce the same light as this bulb. Now, um, this bulb gets really hot, right? What about this bulb? Go ahead and turn yours on. What do you think? Do you think this bulb gets very hot? Not hot. Right, not as hot. How come? It's not it's not using much energy. Going to it. Right. So this is, this is pretty good. It really shows that this thing is a, a pr pretty efficient device. Okay, now this thing is being powered off the solar panels here. I can power a couple of hundred of these bulbs off these solar panels. These are very efficient and this is a lot of solar panels here. This is 600 watts here of, of solar. Uh, now we're going to take a look and see what, what this, this, uh, this thing can really do. So if you could pick up that and hold it up and if you could take the cord and plug it into the middle there. Alright, I'm going to turn this bulb off. Good. Alright, so this is a toaster oven. How, anybody want to guess how much power this is going to use? A lot, that's a good guess. 100? 150? 400. Oh, okay, let's take a look. What do you see there? Oh, you know what? It's um, it's on voltage. It's not on watts. Let me put it back on watts. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's happened because we totally unplugged it. Okay, now what do you see? The same thing. No. But the, the decimal place isn't there now. So it's 1,000. 1,300 something. So that guess back there, the 1,500 was pretty good. So this toaster oven uses a lot of power. This is enough power. If you were to run this for an hour, uh, guess how high that amount of energy could lift me up in the air? 
Take a guess. A few inches. So what? A few inches. A few inches. Ten feet. Ten feet. A mile. Feet. Guess what? Three, ab uh, about two, about two miles in the air. <laughs> so we use devices like toaster ovens, hair dryers, other appliances. They use a tremendous amount of energy. Um, but on the, on the other hand, it's also true that the sun actually gives us a tremendous amount of energy back. That little solar panel was enough to make that water move a lot. Water's pretty heavy stuff. Same with these solar panels. They can produce enough energy to actually power a house or lift you way, 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 way up in the air. Okay, uh, well that's the basic uh, uh, stuff with this. I'm going to show you quickly the insides of this and then, uh, then we'll go on, on inside. Is this like a little mini one? Oh, oh yeah, uh, that's great. In fact, you, you just made me realize. So there's a little broken fan there, but <laughs> go ahead and put your hand over the panel there. So you can stop. Whoa. So the reason I have this is I, I sometimes visit elementary schools, and sometimes it's cloudy. So I'll take this inside, and we'll just shine a light on this to show the kids how it works so we don't have to go outside. Um, and as you can see, it's gone to a lot of elementary schools. It's gotten a little beat up there. But, but it still works. Okay, and uh, let me ask you this. So where, where does your school, or say where does this building get its energy from? Awesome. Power plants. Power plants, right. How does the power get from the power plant to the school? Electric wires. Right, right. Electric wires like those lines that go across there. Okay, so so there's a plant. Now, how does, how does a power plant make electric power typically today, most power plants? Coal. Coal, okay. So here's a piece of coal, right? What color is it? Black. Black. Anybody know what it's made out of? Carbon. carbon. It's made out of carbon. It's mostly carbon. So if I burn this to, make to generate steam and generate electricity, what do, what do I get when I burn carbon? carbon? What CO2 emissions. I get CO2 or carbon dioxide. dioxide, yeah. So. One of the things people are very worried about is putting a lot of that carbon dioxide into the air. A lot of people, scientists, think that this causes the, the, uh, the atmosphere to heat up a lot, and which is a, a theory I believe in. Now, what's this made out of? You had the right term. You called it a fossil, fossil fuel. It's, a, it's literally a fossil. So how about this? What kind of fossil is this? Looks like a fish. Or what else? A prehistoric crustacean. Uh, Take a closer look at it. A plant. Yeah, when you look at it closely, I think oh. it'll it'll look. See, can you see the plant? Uh, okay, so yeah, it, it does look like some kinds of crustaceans too, doesn't it? Now, so this is a fern fossil, and you know, this is the remains of a fern that probably grew hundreds, three hundred million years ago or so. This coal is the same thing. It's it's made out of the the fossilized remains of plants and animals that lived. Uh, lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago. In New Mexico, uh, this coal is actually from the Cretaceous age, and there actually may be pieces of dinosaur left in it. So how about, how about this guy? What, is the, what, is, what kind of dinosaur is this? Plastic one. Plastic one. <laughs> Not that kind. <laughs> um, what, what, kind of, what kind of dinosaur was this? OK. so. Let me ask you, what did a Tyrannosaurus rex eat? Oh, called little dinosaurs. Uh, ate other dinosaurs, little dinosaurs. And what did those little dinosaurs eat? Grass. Grass and plants. And where did the, those grass and plants get their energy from? The sun. From the sun, right? So actually, Tyrannosaurus rex was actually solar powered. How, how about you guys? Where do you guys get your energy from? Food. Food. And where does your food get its energy from? The sun. The sun. You guys are actually solar powered. Look at that. All, all the things built, with all the pyramids, all the things that human beings built with their own muscles, guess what? Those are actually built by, by solar energy. Um, now, what, is, what was this made out of again? Carbon. You're right, but also plastic, right? And where, does, where do we get plastic from? From fossil fuels, right? And what are fossil fuels made out of? <laughs> right, so this is a recycled dinosaur. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Never thought of it that way, probably. All right. Well, let's go inside, and we'll 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 look at some photographs of some other stuff. Come on back.
Um, let's go around the back. I want you to just see the, see the battery. You can walk up, walk up and take a close look. So this is, this is something that's very important for solar energy. Is the sun doesn't shine all the time, so we have to store the energy. And one, one way to store the energy is batteries. We'll talk about other ways when we get inside. Why does it have a hydrogen vent that's labeled here? Well, some kinds of batteries, the kinds that you use in your car, or many of the kinds that people use in a solar system, give off a little bit of hydrogen when they're, when, when they're uh, 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 discharging. So that hydrogen is um, very explosive, right? Guess what would happen if you let the hydrogen build up in here and then there was a spark? It goes boom. It goes boom, right? So this has a little vent in it, and the way that vent works is it just creates an air path from the bottom of the battery box to the top, and there's always a little temperature difference in there. It's always a little hotter at the top than it is at the bottom, and there's a little bit of what we call a convection current. The air just moves, and that allows the hydrogen to drain out through that little vent so that you're always safe. You're never going to open this up and, and go kaboom. Uh, but it has happened that people have built uh, solar systems at home and made the mistake of enclosing their batteries. and. Um, only to have their batteries blow up uh, one fine afternoon. So, not hasn't happened a lot, but it's it's always a possibility. So this this gets rid of that problem. And you see, there's another device over there. You can see that electrical device. Well, the the solar power that comes out of these panels is what we call DC electricity or direct current. It it has a steady voltage all the time. But what we like to use in our houses is called AC. The the, the voltage goes up and down very fast. And that device converts the DC solar electricity into AC power that you, can, you can plug in. AC is alternating current. What is DC? And DC is direct current. <laughs> so what happens is in a solar system like this, because of that device over there, you can plug a regular appliance in there that's got a wall, that's got a plug on the side, just like the wall socket in your house. Anything that you can use in your house, you can use in this. You just plug right in, in and it works. It's kind of neat. Why do we like to use AC? Well, AC, there's some historical reasons. One reason is that generators that turn uh, automatically generate AC, so it's convenient from that standpoint. Um, there's debate. Some people say it's safer because if you grab a hold of a, an AC line, it's oscillating. So your muscles might contract initially, but then, they'll, then the, the voltage goes the other way, and your muscles will go the other way. So you kind of go like this, and, and you can let go of whatever you're grabbing. That's one safety argument that's been made. So if you uh, have DC, you're just going to hold on to it for a long time? Uh, DC would be a, more of a tendency to hold on to it. And there are some advantages. Uh, it's debatable, but there are some advantages for transmitting AC power over lines. It's a little easier in some respects. So It has a lot less power, uh, power drop. Uh, it, it, tends, power drop is it tends to, but now people are building very high voltage DC lines, right. oh, which see. also can function pretty well. So. It's not completely clear that it, we had to go to DC or AC, uh, but the, uh, it's really convenient because the generators produce AC, so that's one, one key idea. Uh, the other thing is, this is just one of those things, that society, society starts off in a certain way. It often doesn't change very easily. It's, this is a lesson you learn if you, if you get into trying to change the world, you find that, that m much of the difficulty is just the fact that we're so used to doing things one way. It takes so much work. If, um, for instance, if we're going to use a different type of vehicle, um, we not only have to get somebody to make those new kind of vehicles, but we have to get people educated on how to how to use them, how to maintain them and repair them, all of the, how to sell them. All of those things have to come in. And that take that takes a lot of time. Okay, let's uh, let's go on inside. I think we have to turn the, uh, uh, all the lights on. Yeah. Yeah, okay, um, so, yeah, so you can make some food. Yeah, don't have any seconds. If you need to use the bathroom at all, it's down this hallway. All right, you guys, I'm going to stand back here, but I've got a laser pointer. You ever seen anything about lasers at all? Can you see the red beam there? 
I'm pointing at a picture of a solar panel up there. That's a laser. Yeah, that's, that's a laser. There, and you see the little speckles there? It's kind of neat. Yeah, and this is the talk that I gave last night, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is pick out the, the really cool stuff and kind of go through that. All right, so here's a picture of some solar systems. These are a solar system up here. You can see the laser pointer there. That's sitting on top of somebody's house. And what's, what's happening is that's making hot water, which is going down inside the house, and they take showers with that. And then there's a different panel over there. That's a hot air panel. So this makes hot water. That makes hot air. And uh, these are real simple things. These are different from the panels we saw outside. All these do is the sun shines on them, and there's a glass cover there, and water flows through the inside, and it gets hot, and it goes down in the house. Same with this one, but this one has air. Can you see on the back of this, there's a big fat pipe up in the back there? That's where the hot air comes out. This one just has hot water, so it has a smaller pipe. You can see there. And here's a big system. This is an, enough solar panels right there to heat a whole house. Uh, um, some of you may live in houses, and you may, not, you may or may not know this, but uh, does anyone live in a house where the heat comes up from beneath the floor, where the, it comes from hot, uh, from hot water pipes beneath the floor? Yeah, OK, a couple people. Well, this is what we call a radiant floor system. And this is a radiant floor system that isn't finished yet. They haven't put the cement over it yet. But what, you can see the pipes underneath there, and they run underneath the floor. So it's a, one great thing you can do with solar energy is take the solar energy that you make out of those panels and run it underneath the floor like that, make the house warm. Uh, here's a totally different idea. <clears throat> and I'm going to come forward for a second here. Okay, which way is, the sun is going down over there. So which way is south? That, that way. way. Right? Okay, so there's south. All right. Now, in the summertime, the sun comes up roughly in the east, and it goes pretty much overhead, and then it goes down. Right? That's how we usually think of the sun. What happens in the wintertime? North or south? You right, got the right idea. Yeah, so it actually, because the, the Earth's axis is tilted, and that tilt always stays the same as the, as the Earth goes around the sun, and that changes, from our point of view, that changes the path of the sun in different seasons. So in the summertime, it goes straight overhead, but in the, in the wintertime, it actually stays way down in the south. So the idea here is to build a house that has a lot of windows facing the south. These windows here, and these windows up here. And so what happens is, in, this, in the wintertime, the sun stays towards the south, and it can shine into these windows, keep the house warm. But what, how about the summertime? What do you think happens then? Sun's in a different position. What did, what did you say? Of course, yeah. Somebody over the windows on the side too. Well, right, exactly. In the summertime, it's hot outside. We don't need any sun to come inside those windows, except maybe a little bit to maybe make it a little bit more light. But in the wintertime, it's, it's cold, right? So you have a lot of sun that can come in, 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 the, in the windows there. All right, um, what else is it? So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, that's how my house is. It is. You have a passive solar house. Okay, and we call this, see the name up there, passive solar? Well, passive means something that just kind of sits there. So this house just kind of sits there, and it's, it's actually the solar collectors. But what moves? What's the moving part? The sun. The sun, from our point of view, right? So this house is a house that automatically stays warm in the sun, or warm in the wintertime, and cooler in the summertime. Get the, get the idea? Okay, and it's real simple. And this idea has been known to human beings for, for, for many millennia. Uh, the Native Americans here in New Mexico built the cliff dwellings. If you go up to those cliff dwellings, you'll find they're always pointed south. Uh, the Greeks built entire cities this way, trying to lay out even the streets and other things. Uh, what else is kind of strange about this building? Anybody notice something kind of weird about it? 
For one thing, it's under construction, right? It's not finished yet. You can see there's stuff out here. What's the house made out of? Hay. It's made out of straw, it's made out of hay, right? So we all know the story about the three little pigs, right? You're not supposed to make a house out of hay. But actually, you can. And, and, and it's strong, too, because it's not just made out of hay. There are support beams and things in there, too. But what's gonna, what, why would somebody want to build a house out of, out of hay like that? What is that yeah, thing? Yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah. Same thing. So this keeps the house really warm. So the house not only lets solar energy in, but it traps it. It keeps it really well. Whenever you have something like hay that has a lot of air inside, and the air can't move, that makes a really good insulator. Uh, you know, when you put on like a heavy down jacket, imagine putting on a heavy down jacket in the summertime. Right? You'd be really miserable, right? But why is it warm? Why is a down jacket warm? Is there any, is there any energy in the down that's coming to you? It has fur, so it's Yeah, it's just, but it's just insulation, right? It's, it's not an energy source. So it's amazing. Air, air actually is a really big insulator. But the reason we don't feel too hot sitting in this room is because the air can move around. But if the air was to stop moving in here, in about five minutes, you would be, you'd be insufferably miserable. And you'd be so warm, and you'd probably die within about half an hour. Okay, yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, let's see, so we're going to go on to some other things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually uh, just jump by different method here. Okay. Now here's a neat sequence I'll show you. Now you're not supposed to read that yet. All right. This is a graph I showed last night and this has some technical numbers on it. It just shows that if you have one square meter, right, about three feet by about three feet, when the sun shines on it, it has a thousand watts of energy in it. That's like more than, or that's about the, the uh, about two thirds of what that toaster oven drew. All right, now, and there's a unit of energy people call a kilowatt hour. This is what your parents pay P&M for. They pay it for the number of kilowatt hours. This is what you get when you run a thousand watts or a kilowatt for an hour. All right, now that energy, one kilowatt hour, just what you get from a thousand watts over an hour. This is 100 kilograms. This is about how much I weigh. Do you remember when I said that that, that could lift me 3.7 kilometers in the air? Yeah. Well, there he is. <laughs> Starting to come down. So you're saying an hour's worth of sunlight? An hour's worth of sunlight. It lift you 3.7 kilometers in the air. Yeah, hour's worth of sunlight on one square meter. Now here, let's go to a square kilometer. This is a, uh, about 0.6 of a mile on each side. It's a pretty big area. But the sunlight that falls on that, and as, if you add it up, it's a, or multiply it out, it's a billion watts. And that's not that big an area. That's like what a big power plant uses. Okay, and I won't get into this too deeply, but when you get into this more deeply, you have to take into account how efficient the solar panels are. Today's solar panels are around 20% efficiency. This is how much of the light they can collect. So to get a billion watts, you really need five square kilometers because you can't capture all of the energy. And you only have six hours to sun a day. So you, to, to do a billion watts all day long or all night long, you're going to need 20 square kilometers to get enough energy. So people work all these things out. And this way, this is how you can avoid building a power plant, is have a solar plant that's two by four miles. Right. And that would power the whole state. So if you work it out, we could get all the electricity in the United States on a, on a piece of land in the desert somewhere, 59 miles by 59 miles. That big a solar panel would power the whole country, everything. Okay. So that's some of the kind of stuff you can do when you get into this. You can work all those things out. I'll show you another thing that's kind of neat. This is how many barrels of oil equivalent to the sunlight you could produce on a basketball court from sunlight in one year. So the idea here is that if you had a solar panel that was the size of this basketball court, 
and you added up how much energy you could actually make with a solar panel, so even including the conversion efficiency and all that. And then you compared that to the energy that's stored in, a, in barrels of oil. This shows you how many barrels of oil you could effectively produce on that basketball court every year. It's 117 barrels worth. So, so how much would 170 barrels of oil cost, and how much would the basketball court size solar panel cost? Well, you have to work this out. The barrels of oil would be, you know, somewhere around 30 to 80, depends on what the prices are doing at the moment, the dollars a barrel. And uh, so, uh, say it was 30, and you multiply by roughly 100, 3,000, 4,000 dollars per year for those barrels. But you get this every single year year after year after year after year, the solar energy never runs out. Whereas, what's happening with oil? It's not renewable. It's not renewable, so what, you know, someday we're going to run out of oil. <coughs> okay, so that gives you some idea how much energy is really there. Let me go to some other pictures. Now let's get serious about solar. Let's do some big stuff. Okay. So here's a giant solar collector. If you stand next to this, you'll need about this tall. And we'll see a picture in a minute. So these are out in California, and they generate power to, to basically replace a big power plant. What happens is you see this big curved glass mirror. So the light comes down and it reflects off this curved mirror and it all reflects into this little lit up pipe right here. And what's going on there is there's a glass tube and then inside that glass tube there's a pipe that's painted black. Why would it be painted black? black right. Attracts the sun or what's the other word? Absorbs the light or absorbs the sun. Yeah, so that gets really hot and they run a hot oil through that, and the oil gets really hot, and then they use that to generate steam and run a power plant. Yeah? How long is that solar panel? That's a good question. You know, I'm not sure exactly how long that is. I'd have to work that out. But could you estimate? Um, well, we'll, you know, we'll see a picture in a minute, and, and, and we can get a better look at it from, from, a, from higher up. So here's it up. Here's another look. So you can see it runs from really far across. See how big these guys are there? So I think that panel is probably something on the order of um, maybe an eighth of a mile or maybe even longer. And that's enough power in that one panel right there for about, um, at, at, at the peak output, about a thousand houses. A thousand houses. And this, this solar farm right here, that when you look at it all together, this can power 200,000 houses. Uh, a lot more than, it, there's a lot of panels there, but it depends on how you count the panels, right? Um, it's, I mean rows. Yeah, there's many rows. There's, there's hundreds of rows. In fact, let me show you from the air. There's, there's it from the air. You can see it up in the air. Now, this may look like a big, big solar farm, right? You might think, oh my God, do we have to build solar farms that big? But actually, we're okay because the, how, the, the number of houses that, would, that this would power is even much, much larger than that. The amount of houses that this would power would be like this whole wall times five, something like that. So it's pretty, it's pretty efficient, actually. Here's another one. Um, somebody just built a new one of these in uh, Nevada. This piece right here isn't as long, but they have a lot of them end to end like that. Okay. Here's another type. Guess what this is called? Power tower, yeah. <laughs> this is pretty cool. So what goes on here is they have these giant mirrors, and they, and, and they don't look that big, but actually those mirrors are really, really big. And they reflect light up into that tower there. See how that tower is really lit up? It's really bright. If you were to stick your hand in there, guess what would happen to you? <laughs> You'd be vaporized, yeah. So, but anyways, this tower, it focuses all that light up there, and they collect all that heat. And they store that heat in those giant tanks right there. And they use that to generate electricity. And that's enough right there for about 10,000 homes. And how is that 10,000 homes per year? Or uh, that's co continuously, give it a good power, continuously. 
Uh, here's another one. That, this one was just built in Spain. And I like this picture because it's near the ground. You can see how big the people are next to the big mirrors. Can you imagine having that in your backyard? <laughs> but these are big, and they reflect light. When, the, when it's working, they reflect light up under that big tower right there, and they collect all the heat there. And I like this because they left the flowers there, too. They didn't just, just mow down the flowers or, or something like that. Let's see. I'm going to go to some other pictures. Okay. Okay, here's a new kind. And this kind was, um, is being built in, right now in Australia. So instead of having that big, remember that big curved piece of glass we had to have for that other kind? Well, that curved piece of glass is really expensive. So what these guys did is they broke that mirror down into little flat pieces like that. And they tilted them at different angles. And if you draw a curve through that, you can find that they, they all add up to give you that curve. And they reflect the light up into that receiver tube up there. So here's a couple pictures of that. Here's the first one that was built recently. And then they're adding on to it now. You can see here's the original one here, and they're adding these other sections. Actually, both of these sections are new. Think of it. Uh, here's another picture. You can see it all lit up there with the, the light shining up in there. It's it really hot. It looks like a light bulb. Kind of, yeah, it looks like a fluorescent light bulb. Only guess which way the energy is going. There's some energy coming back out at you that you can make it that makes it light, but most of the energy is going into it instead of out of it. So it's powering fluorescent light bulbs somewhere else. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Can you see that guy up there? So here you can see how big it is. You can see that um, this is about three feet across here. And he's sitting up there. What would happen if he was sitting there and they turned the mirrors on? <laughs> He'd be cooked. So how does the cost compare? For that versus uh, the curved um, one in California? Well, we think this one's going to be a lot cheaper because it, it gets away from the curved mirrors. And there's a but bunch of other better? advantages it has, too. Is it better? Yeah, we think it's better. It's a newer one. Although the other ones have some other advantages for some s circumstances. So, uh, And the different, the different mirrors can point at different, different receivers, so they don't have to shade each other. So this is a, a good advantage. Whereas this kind, like we had before, you have to leave a lot of space between these collectors because they, they, uh, they shade each other when the sun gets low. So that's some stuff. And <laughs> look at this guy. This is, this is the real solar guy. He's looking through a honeycomb uh, material here. He was a famous guy that lived in, uh, in Italy and then France. Uh, Giovanni Franci Francia. In, um, he died in 1980, and he built the first one of these units in, um, in France back in the, uh, around 1963. What was the guy's name? Uh, Giovanni, uh, probably, uh, I'm not how to say it, I'm not sure how to say it correctly, but probably French Sia or something like that. Okay, here's another kind. Uh, this kind is, uh, is interesting too because it's got a different shape. Now, now the mirror is a big circle, and it reflects light up into this device there. And that thing actually is a generator right there. The, 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 the light comes in, and it heats up air, and the hot air makes the generator turn, and you generate electricity right there. And here's another kind. Um, this is really interesting and strange. So. If you look right there at the base, what they do is they put a wind turbine in there, a, pro a propeller attached to a generator. And this is just like a giant greenhouse. You could even, in principle, you could potentially even grow things in there. And get and the hot air uh, is, while well, sunlight comes in there and it makes hot air, and guess where that hot air goes? Where does it want to go? Right? Right, exactly. So it goes up that chimney, and what does that make the propeller in there do? Spin around, right? Make electricity. So uh, people used to call this a solar chimney, and then they thought, well, chimney sounds kind of like smoke or something. So, so now they gave it the, uh, the boring name, solar upgrade. So where is this one? Well, this was the first test in Australia. 
And the Australians are thinking of building a really, really, really big one. Um, this is a, a, an artist's uh, picture of what it would look like. And here's like a big road to give you some idea. Now, um, I don't think this one's going to work because it's not very efficient. This one takes uh, about, um, about 10 times more land area than the other types we saw. But they like it because it's very cheap. They can make this greenhouse very cheaply. Uh, it's a very simple surface. So, so this gets into the, 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 the complexity of all this. Is It's difficult for people to figure out sometimes what's really the best way to go because there's different possible versions of this. Some people think this version's really good, and other people think the other version's really good. And what's really going to happen is people are going to build a bunch of different versions, and then, then eventually we're going to really find out which ones are cheaper, and, uh, and that will get sorted out. And I think this one is already, the idea for this one is already beginning to fade because it, it, it was just, it just uses too much land. What if you use mirrors to shine with them, to heat up the tower? Well, you could, yeah. If you use mirrors to heat up the tower, guess what you would have? Anybody remember what that's called? A power tower. A power tower, right. That's exactly what? Well, that's how they generated directly in the first season solar updraft. Well, yeah. So, okay, so your idea. That's a neat idea. So your idea is you build something like this, but you have it shine on the outside of the tower, and you make hot air and run the turbine, right? Yeah. So yeah, that, that might work. So that's the kind of thing. If you, you, know, if you think of a new idea, um, you might have an idea that uh, would work better. OK. All right, now we're going to go to a different kind of system. Do you guys remember this one from outside? Okay, so this is just like what we saw outside in the trailer up here. But you can see there's different, they, sometimes they look a little different. And sometimes they're mounted right against the roof like that. Sometimes this one's mounted over a carport so you can park cars under there and keep them cool. This, and these three, this one, this one, and this one are all here in Santa Fe. These are right, right near us here, about less than, less than two miles from us. Right, sitting on top of people's houses. Okay, and look at the name up here. Take a look. The two words there, photo. What does photo mean? <coughs> Tech, what does it mean scientifically? Somebody said. Light. light. It means light. And, and it also, we use it for this, right? Because what do you need to take one of these? Light. You need light, right? So, um, now, voltaic. What does the word volt remind you of? What? Say it again. Electricity. Power, electricity. Right. So it basically means electricity. So this word, photovoltaics, it's kind of a fancy word, but it just means light, electricity. And for short, we just call this PV, just the two letters. And here's the electronic box inside that converts the DC to AC. Real simple. All right, now here's something that people are doing today that is, is kind of interesting. Um, how many of you, you, you buy your power from p and right? Almost everybody, right? That's where your parents buy it or whomever. So we have an electric utility. They're the people who supply the power most of the time if you don't have solar panels. And that electricity flows over to your home. Say this is your house. And it flows through your electric meter. And your electric meter goes this way. And the electricity goes this way. And which way does your money go? <laughs> Your money goes this way, right? Somebody want to hit the next slide there? The advance button? Just a little arrow. Okay, and hit it again. So we're going to add the inverter, the PV array, and another line. Okay. Hit it one more time. All right, now we connect it up. And now we're going to hit, hit one more. All right, now, so now what people are doing now is they're hooking up their solar system right into their electrical power supply. And what happens now is when they're making more solar power than they're using, you notice this arrow is fatter than this arrow, guess where the power goes? It goes back to the utility, back out to other houses. So this is a special arrangement here we call rent meter. So in, under this situation, when you pay your electric bill, you only pay the average of what happens with all the power going this way and all the power going this way. And if they cancel out to zero, guess how much you pay p and 
zero. So this is a special arrangement that our society is doing to promote power plants. Ben, could you tell us how much the solar array that's outside would cost? Oh yeah, let's go back a few um, uh, advance. <coughs> Okay, so to have a solar system on your house like this, that powers your whole house, it's going to cost anywhere today, without including any incentives like tax credits or whatever, it's going to cost you about $10,000 to $30,000. It's about the cost of a car, something like that. Now, that seems like a lot, but on the other hand, you're paying your electric bill every month, year after year after year. And what happens is, the amount of money you save on your electric bill today with these panels is still only will pay for about half of the system. But it's pretty good. About half of it will, will be in offset electricity. Um, the other thing, though, is that we have other things in society. We have uh, the, our, our state government gave us what are called tax credits. And you can save 30 more percent of the cost of those. And then the utility will pay you some extra for generating the power now. And today, when you put all that together, it's roughly uh, what we call break even. It costs about the same now to do this than it does to buy electricity. But without those tax credits, we'd have a problem. This would still be too expensive. And, and we, we're doing this so that we can bring the cost down. And I'll show you now what the cost is going to do. Yeah? Um, if like, the electricity was to go out like, all over the city and you had solar power, would it still work? Or is it like depending on? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So what would happen if the power goes out? Well, if you have one of these systems hooked up to the electric grid and you don't have any batteries, then you, you, you'd have a problem. When the electric grid goes down, your system would go down too. But many people have a, have a special set of batteries now that they hook up and they keep it charged to the solar panel. And then when the, when, the, when the power grid goes down, they walk out to the garage and they hit us, they, they flip a switch, and that switches them over to the solar batteries. And then they can run off their solar batteries, and their solar panels will keep those batteries charged. Okay. So yeah. How long do the um, photovoltaic panels last without getting like damaged or weather beaten? Oh, really good question. How long do these last? These are really tough. If you buried one of these solar cells in the ground and came back 100 million years from now and nobody <coughs> stepped on it, it would probably still be there. So the material itself is really, really durable. Okay. Now so there are are. Is that? What did you step on? If you step on it, it might it might break. So, so the material is still in there? Yeah, so they're fairly fragile. So what they have to do is they put a very tough cover on there that you can't see, but it's a transparent cover that's hail proof. So you can I knew you were gonna ask that. So you get pretty good hail up to about this size, uh, definitely just bounces right off. Really, really big hail you might have a problem with, but that happens so rarely, and most people have some insurance on their system that it's it's um, it's not a problem for them. Uh, what it would be a bad thing if we had giant hail balls everywhere once in a while. But if that happened, I think we'd have a lot more problems than solar panels. We'd be all. And also, worried. you had us cover the cells. If one gets covered or two whole ones get covered, the power completely shuts off. Yes. Like, you, what about like leaves and stuff? Like yes, that? you have a good point. You want you don't want the sh any shade on these. And in this particular system, these panels right there actually do get a little shade from some trees that are over here, and that's not a good thing. Uh, but they weren't willing to trim the trees, so they just decided to, to live with a little bit of that solar power. But in general, most of the time, you want to keep these up away from the trees, and none of these other systems have any shade ever. Except maybe if a plane flies over, that's so rare that it would be a problem. Any other questions like that? Those are good, good questions. So are those two panels saying the bottom, bottom left enough to power a house? Um, yeah, this, this is enough to power an energy efficient house. The, the, the person who lives in this house, it's one person, and the person who lives in this house uses those, those uh, uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs, the one with the uh, sort of curly Q shape that we saw outside. And, and other appliances that are efficient. Um, a lot of it depends on how, on how efficient you are. If you use very old appliances, you'll need maybe many more, maybe, maybe even four times as many solar panels. But if you're very efficient, most houses can get by with something like this. Maybe, and maybe up to twice as much, depending on the house. Yeah? 
Is there a technology that allows these uh, panels to swivel or sort of rotate depending on where the sun is? Yeah, I don't have a picture in this presentation right here, but some people mount these even in their backyard on a big, on a big uh, panel and it follows the sun every day. And we call that a power flow. And there was somebody else over here? Okay, let me go to some other photos now. charge battery last year. Like like oh, one of those big systems like that, if you kept it in a battery? If you didn't use the battery, it would slowly go down over many months, what's called the self-discharge rate. So you need to keep them charged if you're not using them, just a little bit of power to keep them charged. And then when you're using them, it all depends on how fast you're taking the energy out. Well, well let's say you have um, maybe four or five days where you have Constantaneous rain and clouds over. There. Right. So people who live completely off the power grid typically have more batteries than, than other people would with a grid tied system. And they usually get enough batteries to get them through about a week or so without any sun. Um, and when it gets really cloudy like that, they may have to take some measures like being careful how much they run the washing machine and when they run the machine and stuff like that, those big loads. But pretty much people can get by pretty well. And then even some people even have a backup generator. All right, let's see. Let's look at some interesting stuff here. So, um, by the way, for those of you that are interested in the interest of how much this cost, um, this is the range of cost today over here compared to what you pay PNM. But this is the predicted cost over time, say in 2015, about 10 years from now, a little less than 10 years from now eight years, we expect the cost to be very, very competitive, and it's been coming down very, very fast. So people are very, very excited about this now. So do we wait? So what? So do we wait to buy when it's cheaper? Well, that's a good question. It depends. If you just want to be able to take advantage of the solar power, you don't want, you're not necessarily concerned about helping it become cheaper, then you should wait. But if you want to, if you have the money and you want to help it get cheaper fast, now now's the best time. So you have to think about what is your intent as a human being What's your intention? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish there? So how many people have uh, a hybrid car? A couple of people here. Three, four. Wow, that's pretty good. I, when I ask these kind of questions, more and more hands go up every time. Um, so some of you have heard about hybrid cars. Anyone know what they are? What makes them different from a regular car? Mm -hmm. um, it's half battery and half gas. Mm -hmm. so Right, it's more efficient because of that. Yeah. And it runs off battery when you stop, which I thought was a dumb idea, but the more and more I thought about it, you use most gas when you're just kind of sitting at a stoplight. That's right, and when you're braking, you have all that kinetic energy, and, and with the, the, that car can, instead of just burning off that as you brake, it actually turns a generator and puts that into the battery. What else? What about hybrids? Any other comments? Okay, now. That's funny it's got a battery. Yeah, some of them are there. are a little funny looking. That's mostly a style issue. They, they, they off the yeah, where they're really quiet. They can just shut down. They don't have to make any noise. Um, you have to press the brakes and press the power button. Oh, in some cases, some hybrids, you do some stuff like that with the buttons. That's right. Control it, right? Yeah. Um, when some blind people don't feel the hybrid, they're oh, Right, right. So that's that's actually a serious issue if uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't know that much about how blind people relate to cars, but if they're cueing off the sound of the car, there could be some issue. So maybe we'd want to add little 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 light noisemakers or something on there to cue people in. Interest that's a really good point. Oh, okay, so now, so hybrids have a battery in them. How does the how does the energy get into the battery though? What generates the what's generating that? Um electricity. From and so where does electricity yeah, come from? Well, they can do it from turning. Now, let's, let's just get into that. So, oh, the engine. Yeah, what is it in the engine? What does the engine have to have inside it? Too? Well, it's got to have a regular engine, but it's got to have something what? else in there to make electricity. Well, what do we call a device that when we turn it, makes electricity? Generator. Generator. It's actually got a generator built into the engine, so that's the last component. All right, so now, imagine this. Imagine taking a... Uh, a Toyota Prius, say a which is a hybrid, and adding extra batteries to it. Now, what could you do? How could you? What would happen? Give me some idea. Of what do you think? What would happen if I added extra batteries to a, a, a hybrid? What More kind of electricity? More gas. More electricity. I use less gas, right? I run more electricity than on gas. Good. So, in fact. What if I put the extra batteries in, and then when I park the car at night, I actually plug the batteries into the wall side? Mm -hmm. Then what could I do? And then? I could just run on electric power, right? Okay, so people are actually doing that. There's some people doing that, and the car companies are talking about selling cars that do that. So that's called a plug-in hybrid. What's, what's the effect of carbon footprint? What's the carbon doing there? Well, is it burning the electricity coming from? Okay, very good question. So uh, let, let me get you first, and then I'll come back to that. Yeah. Well, what, but couldn't you just put a solar panel on it, and then because it takes uh, it takes energy to make the electricity could even go into the battery, yeah? And we just put on a solar panel. Like that? Mm -hmm. You bet. That's what that guy did. <laughs> okay, good. Or the plugging part could plug into a socket. So. Right, so and he, he raised a really good question. Suppose you have the plugging car, and suppose you don't use the solar panel, but you plug it into the wall. Well, where does the electricity coming out of the wall come from right now? Okay. Well, you can, you can, you do have the option to get your electricity coming when you have power. Very good. So if. This, the, the PNM actually sells wind power, so you can sign up for that. So if you sign up for wind power, then you can charge your car off of the wind power. So theoretically there, your carbon footprint would be much lower. Or you could charge it off, as he was suggesting, the solar panel. Now, do you think that's really practical, adding a little solar panel like that? What, how many people think it might be a little questionable to do that? Yeah, okay. So, your intuition would be right. That's not quite enough solar power. This guy can get about 10% of his driving off of that little solar panel. What you really need is a bigger solar panel, and what you really do is you put it on your roof, and you, you, you charge it at nighttime, or charge it when the car is parked, or they'd be on, on, your, on, on the roofs of all the buildings, flowing into these things, and wherever you go, you can plug into it. Okay, but that's the idea. So. Uh, so we're seeing this is a really big thing that's happening. There are, there are actually companies now you can take your Toyota Prius to and have the batteries added. And car companies like Toyota have said they're actually going to sell these things. So the idea here is that you could do a lot of your local driving completely on, on renewable electricity, either from PNM or from local solar panels. And then when you need the long distance, the farther than the batteries can take you, you still have the gas in to back you up. And there's another thing you can replace the gasoline with, potentially. Anyone know what that is? Maybe hydrogen. There are hydrogen test cars. Vegetable oil. Vegetable oil, right. So another way, so let's think about what is vegetable oil? Where does vegetable oil come from? It comes from the sun. Right. And where do vegetables get their energy from? The sun. So if you use vegetable oil, you're really using the, the sun power. So yeah, so, um, so we're looking at a kind of all these things kind of coming together in a very interesting way. Yeah. Would it be efficient for like um, car engineers or whatever to, <clears throat> to figure out how to make like, the entire body of the solar panels? 
Yes, that's a really neat question. There are solar panels today, even which can be which can be curved on, and, and put on curved surfaces, and some of those are getting more and more efficient. And I think I think it's 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 a possibility that within 10, 15, 20 years we will see cars being sold where the whole body ha has photovoltaic cells built right into the surface. That's not totally outlandish. Now, you wouldn't be using the solar power all that efficiently because not, like, like this car, only part of the cells are in the sun at any one time, but the idea is there. Let me start from left to right, so. Um, the problem of having photovoltaic cells all over the car, what if you get in a wreck? Yeah. Well, that's a good question, but, but that's a good question that cars are expensive anyways, right? So what do we do for cars? How do we take care of that in society? We get insurance, so you'd have, you might have a, a photovoltaic insurance line on your car insurance. And, and then you. She took it. Good, that's a good question. What are the emissions from a car that uses vegetable oil? Oh, so, that's a good question. So what, what are the emissions from a car that uses vegetable oil? Well, there are some studies today that show if you take that vegetable oil, either burn it directly in a diesel car or you make biodiesel, there are some there are some health issues that the emissions can be a little damaging. But we pretty we're pretty sure that's because those cars haven't been optimized to run. The, the, the pressure in the cylinders and the temperatures and things like that haven't been adjusted to run just right with, with the veggie oil. It's been shown that when you move to cars that are optimized, that it appears you, you get less harmful emissions because the um, what they call the aromatic hydrocarbons in the fuel, the, the complex uh, molecular structures in the fuel are simpler, much simpler than veg oil, and you get less complicated chemicals coming out, and, and that leads to them being less harmful. From, from a carbon footprint standpoint, it's much better if the, if the fuels, if the vegetable oil comes from a source that's being grown efficiently without a lot of use of fossil fuels. But there's a lot of details there too. There are some very good ways to produce vegetable oil and some very destructive ways. So that all has to be taken care of. Yeah. Let me come back. So does this kind of, does this car run only on solar panels? Or does it also run on Ah, no, so this car right here gets still gets about 90% of its energy ultimately from the gasoline. But, it, but it's still using the gasoline much more efficiently because it's a hybrid. And then it's getting about 10% from the solar panel there. And then, yeah, okay, well then you'll have to take that all into account, right? If this solar, if, if it never got cloudy or never nighttime, this solar panel would produce maybe five times as much as it does. And this guy maybe could get 50%. So that all has to be taken into account. And, and we do take, when we give the cost of solar energy, we do take that into account. There was another question over here, I thought. I was just wondering, um, like I've heard about cars that sometimes, or vegetable oil cars, that you can get the like, grease from restaurants. Yes, there are people right here in town uh, doing that. Uh, they, they, get the, they get the grease from a, a restaurant and they filter it. And what you can do with, with vegetable oil grease is, all you have to do to use it in the car is you put it in a special tank in the car and then when, before it's fed into the, into the diesel engine, it's heated up to a certain temperature that makes it able to burn. And guess what the car, if it comes from McDonald's, guess what the car smells like? French fries. French fries. Right. Now, there's a question here. How many cars in Santa Fe do you think you could, you could fuel off of using just the vegetable oil? Thank you, guys. Five. Guys, we're right, in the, right in the really close. I think the estimate's around 200. It's very close to your ass. So, you know, it's not that many. Well, um, I mean, we, we wouldn't, uh, a multitude of people wouldn't be able to get their gasoline respectively from people that, that, that their restaurants and stuff, right? So how, how else would you go about getting So, well, one of the things people are proposing that works very well is and this is still in the development stage, but it looks like it's going to work very well, is they grow algae in, in tanks. And it turns out it's very, very efficient. It absorbs, a, it absorbs sunlight like very well because the algae particles are very small and they're very effective at converting solar energy into, into oil. And you, you harvest this algae and you can then convert that oil that you get out of that algae into what we call biodiesel. And that can be just shipped to diesel filling stations. 
right now we're getting most of the biodiesel from plants like sorghum, soy. Uh, we're getting most of the ethanol, which is another biofuel from corn. Uh, but people have better ways to get that fuel, and that's starting to, to, to happen. Well, the problem with ethanol and biofuel is that because they use corn, places like Mexico, are, that's a main food source, and it's they're a poverty-stricken country, corn prices have gone extremely high. That's right. Corn, corn, if you make, do you remember the solar, remember the picture I showed of the basketball court and the 117 barrels of oil you can get from the solar? Well, guess how many barrels of, of oil you can get from just growing corn in that same acre? Guess how many? What'd you say? You're, that's a pretty good guess. It's just a little bit under one. It's almost nothing. So corn is a very inefficient way to make ethanol. And people are switching over to that worldwide. And it is causing a shortage of corn for food uh, stores in some parts of the world, causing corn prices to go up. And that's, that's a problem. So. Um, so, for instance, my group is trying to look at really shifting over to these much more efficient ways of producing ethanol. But why, why are people interested in switching over to, in, to biofuels like ethanol and, and uh, uh, biodiesel? Uh, because the ozone layer is being depleted by all the cars. There's environmental concerns, right? Uh, we're running out of fossil fuels. We're running out of fossil fuels. And I don't want to get into a lot of political stuff, but there's a lot of things between our country and other countries in the world that have a lot of oil, a lot of problems there. So people are very interested for many reasons. Um, global warming is one because of the carbon emissions from the fuels, dependence on foreign oil, um, and other environmental problems. So there's a lot of reasons why people would want to do this. Hi, do you want to come in? Still pretty bright out there. Okay. And we're I think we're almost done here. That's one or two other photos I want to show you guys. Alright, how many people have seen a giant wind turbine? Quite a few now. Let me see. I just want to get some idea where have you seen those? Southern California. Southern California? Spain. Spain. Oh, I, I saw them in Spain, too. Where? Texas. Texas. Wow. Yeah, they have a lot there. Where else? Canada. Canada. Well, that's interesting. Colorado. Colorado. Yes. Okay. How about New Mexico? Have you seen them? Uh, near Santa Rosa. Near Santa Rosa. Right. So, in fact, these wind turbines right here are out in Santa Rosa. Guess how tall this turbine is from there to there. Right? 200 feet. <laughs> Guys nail it, it's about 210 feet right there. Guess how long one of those blades are right there? Like 40 feet. 50. 50. Like 70. About 100. What? So take take a look. Take a look. See these guys standing here? Look at the turbine on the ground in the background. This is quite a ways behind them. Look at the size of the blade coming out there. Now look at it up there. Okay, now take one of these guys and shrink him down and put him up right there. Is this a little tiny guy right along there? So if you were standing under there, that's what you'd look like. It's a little tiny guy. So these things, I like to say, these things are kind of like an airplane on a stick. <laughs> somebody hands you a popsicle, well, somebody could hand you a 747 sickle. <laughs> so that's what this thing is. It sits up there way up in the air where there's a lot of wind power. And in New Mexico, like many states, there's a lot of wind power potential, and it's, it's out here on the eastern plains of New Mexico. We don't notice it too much here because we have too many mountains and things. It doesn't get that windy here. But if you go out to where these ranchers live, see these guys with the hats here? They, now, one of the things that's good about wind power is that is the people like ranchers can, can have companies come in and put these on the land, and they can rent the land out, so they can make money off of renting that wind power. And they can still keep their ranches going out there. So when we met these guys, we went out and they were building this wind farm. And, um, they were so happy. They were showing us around. We all had to wear construction hats like that, but they wouldn't take off the cowboy hats. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, wind power is growing really fast. This is a really big wind farm in New Mexico. If you look way out on the horizon, can you see way out on the horizon? There's more of them. They're all along the edge of this mesa right there. There's enough wind power in this wind farm to power the whole city of Santa Fe, basically. 
And, and that is flowing into the grid about 8%. It goes in and flows out all, to all sorts of places. And in Santa Fe, about 8% of the power coming out of the wall socket is from this particular wind farm. Wow. In fact, this wind turbine right here is in a sense generating energy coming out. It's powering this screen right now. Wait, so How much does each turbine um, generate? Come back. If you don't request wind energy, it's still 8%. Yeah, now, but so it's, it's, you can request up to 90%, and then they have to provide the other 10% automatically. So everybody, by 2011, PNN has to provide everybody with 10%. By 2020, it has to go up to 20%, and then people can sign up to get more. And when you sign up to get more, the way this is really an accounting system, when you sign up to get 90%, they can't count that 90% towards what they have to do for everybody with 10%. It's a little bit more expensive right now, the way PNM is doing the accounting, and that's because it costs, it has some costs because they have to ramp down their power plant in a certain way. It's a little hard to do that. However, in some utilities, it's actually cheaper now than the other sources. And I think with PNM over time, it's going to actually very soon potentially, it's going to be actually cheaper, and people may not have to pay any extra to sign up for that. This happened in Colorado. The wind got cheaper than the conventional. And now there's a waiting list for those programs that people want to sign up and they can't because they haven't built enough wind turbines yet. So, so basically, when we're, um, when we're signing up for wind power from PNM, we're just for, essentially forcing them to generate more wind power? They have to generate it for you when you sign up for it. So that power has to be generated and put on the grid. And as I'm saying, there's another law that says they have to produce 10% for everybody. And they can't count that they sell you at, at the extra four cents. So it's a way of growing the amount. Because in actual fact, it's all the same electricity coming out of the grid. Right, it's all the same. You can't really tell where the electrons come from. And if you really get into, into the science of quantum mechanics, it's actually it's actually not just a trivial number that you can't track the electrons, but uh, more even more fundamentally, it's uh, all the electrons are part of uh, of, a, of a larger thing that physicists call a quantum field, and that is not something you can really take apart on the pieces. So it's one big quantum field. From our There's a question over here. Yeah, well, how much does each turbine generate? Oh, good question. So one of these turbines right here can generate, on average, because the wind doesn't blow all the time, so on average, it generates about enough power for about 300 homes. I'll give you some idea. So imagine 300 homes sitting out there. They get, they can get all their power from that, and that's a big unit. Remember how big that is? That's not a. That's 100 feet long. Oh, they're much quieter. You get a little swish swish from them now. Uh, in the old days, they used to be noisier, and they're even getting quieter. Uh, I don't know if I have a picture of a particular one. I'll show you one that's um, See, I don't have it in this presentation. There's a new one out, a small wind turbine that's very, very quiet. Super, super quiet. Okay, and here's a neat idea that I think uh, is really new. I'll just show this one quickly. You see the little wind farm up there? In the corner? Well, one of the problems with wind power is it doesn't, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So what people are starting to do is to take that wind power and compress air underneath the ground in, a, in an aquifer. So they, what they do is they take that wind power and they power, a, they power a motor which turns an air compressor and it, you know, it pumps air down underground. And then when they want the wind energy back, they run that compressed air back up through and it turns a turbine really fast. And generates electricity and puts that in the power grid. And does it work? And it works really well. Yeah. And, uh, Iowa's building the first uh, wind power version. There's a non wind power version of this in, um, I think it's Georgia or Alabama that's been running for many, many years. And so when people say there's no way to store wind power, well, actually there is. Kind of interesting. Let's see. I thought, do you guys want to see a little bit about how a solar panel works inside? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll start with this slide, because this is kind of interesting, too. Um, this just shows the new kinds of solar panels people are making that you can lay right down on the roof like tiles or on top of buildings like this. So they're a lot flatter and they look a lot better. Yeah. Um, I was watching a show on PBS on Science. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about this um, inventors invented some alloy that like collects sun like a lot more efficiently or something. Yes. Is that the 
Um, you know, that's a good question. So uh, when I made my, my presentation last night, I talked a lot about these new kinds of, um, of solar cells. And there's a whole bunch of new kinds of solar cells that are, are coming out uh, one by one. And I'll show you a little picture there that might, exp that might explain part of it. Um, like this is what's called, this is one of those, it may not be the same one you're thinking about, uh, but this is what's called nanosolar. And what they do is they use these little tiny particles of, of, a, of, a, of an alloy. It's a copper, indium, gallium, and selenium. All, all, these, all these chemicals are, all these basic elements actually put together into these microscopic little particles. And these absorb light and convert them into electricity. And instead of building them into a regular solar panel, they just roll this on as an ink. See the roller here? It just, it just spreads it onto this material. And then they take it inside an oven and they bake it. And it looks like it's a lot, potentially a lot cheaper. They're, they're saying it's going to be a lot cheaper than regular solar panels. We don't really know for sure if they're really going to be that cheap, but it looks really promising. What are those guys going to be in the market? Uh, sometime either, well, they say they're actually shipping some uh, quietly to Germany right now. So they're, they're already entering the market, but um, it's hard to get, it's hard, it seems to get hard to get your hands on a sample. So we're not really sure. Um, I'll give you another idea here. Here's what's called a dye sensitive cell. Uh, these, these are, um, uh, use a, uh, an element called ruthenium. Instead of silicon, they use ruthenium. And they put this in an organic molecule. It's down here and it's in a dye. And it can be like these tubes up here. These are actually uh, liquid tubes of dye. And then they, they put that dye in contact with some other materials and those materials pick up the electrons and that is what makes the, the solar power. And I'll show you, I'll give you a better idea how solar panels work now. So that makes a little more sense. That's a pretty cryptic explanation. Okay, so here's something about how a photovoltaic effect actually works. Okay, so what they do is they, you see where it says N up there? That's, the, that's what we call the N material. This is a layer of silicon. It's, it's actually, in reality, it's very thin. I just draw it really thick here. And they, they put some other elements in there that have some extra electrons. And those extra electrons, like the blue electron there, they make this, this material have more negative charge in what we call the conduction band that can move. And that's called N material because of that negative charge. And we also take some other silicon and we put some other element in there that's missing some electrons. So it has these holes in it. That's called the P material. And then what happens is that electron up there, he wants to come down and get trapped into this P material. So that happens. He migrates down there. And a whole bunch of them do that. And then what happens is you have this layer of electrons here. This is negative charge here. And you have these holes up here where the electrons used to be. And these are positively charged. And what that does is it creates a built-in electric field. So when you see a solar cell, what you're really seeing is a material that has an electric field built into it from the top to the bottom. It's always there, even at night, just sitting there. OK, and then what happens is the following. Inside that material, you have all these, elect all these other electrons that are sitting in the material. And silicon has a very special property. It has what's called a band gap. This is a... This relates to the quantum physics of, of the material. And what it means is, is that the electrons either have to be down here or they, or they have to be excited up to a higher energy level. And they can't be in an energy level that's in between here. And this is very important, this property called the band gap. So what happens is a photon of light comes in there. and It charges up one of these photons. It kicks it up to a higher energy level. So what you have in the material is you have an excited electron and you have a hole together like that. But guess what? This, these two are sitting here now. They're sitting here inside this electric field that's built into the material. And get, guess what that electric field does to them? <coughs> Anybody guess? What happens if you have an electric charge in an electric field? What does it want to do? It yeah, it repels. So this guy is repelled by these down here, and the, the cross is repelled by the other crosses up here, the positive charges. And so they migrate, they get pushed out. And now they can't fall back together again. So guess what they have to do to recombine? Well, you attach a wire out here through an electrical load. So to get home, that charged electron there, he can only do one thing. He can only come through the load. 
And then right there, he releases his energy to the load and he drop, drops down his energy level. So you can see that over there. And then migrates back and then boop, they recombine. And the process would start over again. So that's how a solar panel is. Good. That's the key thing. Is that? Let me go back to it. This is the yeah. So you you're asking the key question. So why doesn't this electron? Right here. Let's make it the button on this laser pointer. This electron. Why doesn't he fall back into the hole? Basically, right? Oh, now these are, are built in at a lower energy level. I'm not showing these on the graph, but these are actually built in. At, they're trapped at a lower energy level. They, they're fixed in the material. So he can't really fall back into them. That's a structural defect in the material, effectively. That's a, not, a nice, not the best way to say it, but that's how it works out. This guy is at a higher energy level, and he's trapped up in that higher energy level. What would happen is if he, in principle, he... You could think he could fall in there, but that would upset the balance between these two, and these would rearrange, and, and another electron would be kicked out somewhere. So that's another way to look at it. And there's all kinds of things going on. Um, there's new materials. I'll show you one really neat graph. There's a material up at Los Alamos National Lab um, where when we, what we saw was that the, uh, the photon that came in could only excite one electron, but in the new materials, they can excite an electron, and then, see, see, and see he's way up there in energy, so he excites it a lot, and then he can interact with these other electrons now in this special material, and what can happen is more than one electron can get stuck up here in the excited state, so you can capture more of the solar energy. And if you have a big photon coming in, super excites the electrons, shoots it way, way up there, then that guy can interact with all these electrons down here. And when you're done, it can kick them all up into that upper excited state there. So there's all kinds of neat stuff happening with the, with the physics of these materials. Okay, and I think um, I'm going to wrap up here and show you some stuff. So what is it that makes solar power anyways? The sun. The sun. The sun. How, what's going on inside the sun to do that? Carbon. You, yeah, fusion. So what's happening in there is the hydrogen nuclei inside the sun are fusing together into helium. And when they do that, they release a little bit of energy. So when the, as the sun is making helium and other elements, it's also releasing energy. And that's what, what, so it's actually, it's actually a nuclear reactor. But it's a really good nuclear reactor. Why? What's good about it? It's 93 million miles away. It's 93 million miles away, right? And how about this? Right? It stores its own waste. It comes with its own fuel. It doesn't cost anything to run. Um, now, with, with big nuclear reactors today on planet Earth, there's a lot of issues about when they finally reach the end of their lifetime, it costs a lot to, what we say, decommission them. So, with the sun, we don't have to do that. I like this one a lot. Can you imagine if you woke up one morning and they said in the radio, well, the sun's going to be down today. And we're all, we're all going to freeze to death by noon. Um, but it should be back up tomorrow. This is a little bit political. <laughs> now, ah, there's a mistake here. This should say <coughs> out. And I thought I fixed that last night. But there. So one of the nice things about solar power is that it's distributed all over the Earth. And even in pretty high latitudes up near the <coughs> North Pole, it's actually fairly useful. You can find solar collectors powering radio transmitters and things, even up, even up there. 
So that was my presentation. Take your trash and put it in the trash barrel.